When it comes to do-it-yourself boosted intake manifolds, how come this one worked and this one didn't? Let's find out. In this video, we're gonna cover why the twin plenum, twin throttle body adjustable intake didn't quite work out on our turbocharged two valve and why the 4.6 liter three valve supercharged intake did. Now on the three valve version, that's a good story. You see, we went from an adjustable prototype intake to a finished naturally aspirated intake to a supercharged intake. And in truth, the last two were basically the same. But in addition to that, I've got two other tests. I've got a 4.6 liter two valve non PI motor and I can talk about the stupid things I did with that test. I've also got a 4.6 liter two valve PI motor, which was the most powerful PI combination I ever did. Lots of stuff to cover, let's get going. My first test is actually a tale of woe, and it's not a boosted intake at all, it's a naturally aspirated intake, and it's something I did before we were able to add boost to the same combination. Back in the day, I did a series of stories for muscle Mustangs and fast forwards on a 4.6 liter non-PI Mustang. This was a 98 GT, and I got it in my fixed goal, hey, I'm gonna make 300 horsepower at the tire with a non-PI motor, and I'm not gonna cheat. I'm not gonna use PI heads, which is the exact thing that I would tell everybody to do if you were doing this combination and wanted to make 300 horsepower at the tire take the non-PI stuff off, put PI stuff on, hopefully ported PI stuff, put cams in it, and away you go, and it's a home run slam dunk deal. But no, I didn't do that. I decided not only was gonna make 300 at the tire with all non-PI stuff, it also had to be something that I could actually drive around because this was my daily driver car. So I set pretty high goals, and this required me to make my own custom intake. And the reason for that is, I tried everything that I could. We tried different cams. I tried a different short block. <laughs> I tried long tube headers, different exhaust, different throttle bodies, pulleys. I tried all kinds of stuff. We even ran nitrous on it before that just because I got tired of not succeeding. And all we could get to was about 280 or so horsepower at the tire, no matter what we did. We tried ported non-PI heads. We tried everything. And it just wasn't going to get there. So I decided, you know what, the problem is, this is a bad intake manifold, and there weren't a lot of aftermarket intakes available for the non-PI stuff. Sure, there was a ton of PI stuff. If I would've just put PI heads on it, I would've had a field day, we could've run anything we wanted, made our number and be done with it, and then I could've added a boost, which is what I wanted to do in the first place. But I didn't do that. I have to go with non-PI stuff. So since there was no intake manifolds available, I made my own. And here's a picture of it. We actually made it, put it in the car, and ran it and drove it around, and it did make the number. It allowed us to get from low 280s all the way up over 300 at the tire. And the nice thing about this combination, I spent a lot of time doing like the prototype development of the runner lengths that I wanted and stuff. And we, and we changed the plenum volume, the air inlet, and I made that all big enough so that it worked well and it had plenty of airflow. And it had more than enough flow to feed our non-PI heads even though they were ported. But the nice thing I liked about this manifold is I did enough work on it that we actually didn't lose a ton of power down low. As a matter of fact, we lost very little. Now it's easy to put a short runner intake manifold on like the Reichart Racing stuff that guys used to do for the PI stuff. And sure, the short runner stuff will make more power at the power peak, but it loses a ton down low. And I just didn't want to do that, especially on a driver. So I made this custom manifold and it picked up the power that we needed. All of a sudden I was a hero and I could tear all that stuff off and we put a Kenny Bell on it. Let's get to our next <laughs> test. Test motor number two was also a 4.6 liter two valve. And if you might've noticed in the previous test on the non-PI deal, I didn't have dyno results and there's a reason for that. You see, recently within the last month or so, my hard drive on my computer crashed. I mean, when I say it crashed, it crashed like all of it. I took it in to have it serviced so that they could recover the data. And I've already taken it to one place and they weren't able to do it. So now I gotta send it off to the CSI lab, some sort of upscale deal to see if those guys can recover some of this data. And yes, I know that you guys are gonna comment and say, hey, well, why didn't you have backup? I did have backup, but because I load stuff on here, I didn't have all of that backup together. So I had it in various spots all over the place. And it's hard to find some of this data and sometimes it's hard to find the data, sometimes it's hard to find the, the photos that go with the data and it just needs to be or, more organized. And if I had the, <laughs> the hard drive for that computer, all that would be solved. So I sent it off, I'm hoping to get it back, but right now all I can do is talk to you about how cool some of this stuff was. 
So this was another test I ran back in the day. I, want, I decided that after running a ton of like 4.6 or 2 valve PI testing for my book that I did back in the day, I wanted to like get this thing to try to make 500 horsepower. Now we'd already done 400 and that's easy with a PI. That's just ported PI heads, cams, headers, you know, and away you go. Pretty easy deal. But we'd never gone to 500. So again, the problem like with the non-PI combination that I did, we set a fairly lofty goal, but I was a little bit more liberal in what I would allow <laughs> us to get there. I actually stepped up in displacement and we stepped up in compression. So I built a five liter short block with a flat top piston valve relief so we could run big cams. So I put a set of ported PI heads and this is before TFS had their head because I was complaining to everybody, somebody please make a aftermarket PI head and you will sell a million of them because there are none out there and we need them. All we have is the ported PI stuff, which worked fairly well, but I knew that there was more to be had there. So the trick flow guys finally stepped up, but this is before they did that. So we used a set of ported PI heads from the guys at Total Engine Airflow. I put the biggest uh, off the shelf cams that Comp had, which I think was a 278 in the higher lift PI version and we had run it with a PI intake, and I think we got it to make around 450 or so, something like that, 450 or 460. I wanna say it was 455. Um, and so that's as good as we could get. So I tried some other intake manifolds, but nothing would get us anywhere near where we wanted to go. So I decided, you know what I gotta do? I gotta make my own. So I made this adjustable dual plenum deal, and it allowed me to dial in kind of where we wanted to be. And, and since I was only interested in a peak power number, we just kept shortening the runners. And we kept, and if you'll notice on some of these photos, there are some provisions for injectors on top of the plenum spraying into the open uh, radius entry. And I'll show you a picture here of the radius entry that I made in these plenums. So we were trying to spray fuel in there because as we know, when you change the injector placement, you can increase the power. So we were trying all kinds of stuff. I tried different size um, dividers and connecting the divider and connecting it at different spots. I tried radius entries on the throttle body, all kinds of stuff. But ultimately, after having this adjustable manifold, we were able to get there. Well, we were almost able to get there. We made 488 horsepower, 489 horsepower at the flywheel, which I thought was pretty good and it's the most I had done. But the only reason I was able to do that is because we had this adjustable manifold at our disposal and could play with it and get it to do the kind of thing that we wanted. So now let's check out our boosted intakes, both on a 4.6 liter two valve on the twin turbo deal, which only kind of worked, <laughs> and the 4.6 liter three valve, which actually worked very well. Okay, once again, I don't have all of the dyno data on the twin turbo 4.6 liter two valve, that twin turbo motor that I use for the thumbnail in this thing, and that's really cool. It's like, it reminds me of the old Can-Am stuff, which is like super cool. But I do have dyno data on the three valve stuff, because that's the last test that we're gonna talk about. So I have full dyno data on that, both NA and supercharged, so it's pretty cool stuff. But on this twin turbo deal, it's a real quick story. We did a bunch of stuff to try to get this thing. What I wanted to do is, again, we set a lofty goal. We wanted to make a thousand horsepower with a two valve motor, which is, you know, looking back, I don't know why we thought it was such a big deal. We already had two valve motors making between 400 and 440 horsepower, depending on what size they were. All we had to do was add boost, but I tried to overcomplicate everything and run this adjustable manifold. One, because it, I thought it would allow me to make more power NA than it would be easier to do under boost. And also, because just look at the photo. <laughs> I mean, it looks awesome. Two turbos, two outlets out of the intercooler. I even had the guys, Jimmy and uh, Nathan over HP Performance, make me this custom intercooler with these um, tanks on it to have two outlets so I could have one tube going to each one of the throttle bodies. So it looks super cool. And really, that's half the job. But here's the problem, and here's why it didn't work. And it didn't work not because of the runner length or because the twin plenum or because they were combined or anything like that. The manifold itself worked fine. It made the power that we wanted in A and it would do it under boost. The problem was when we turned the boost up to try to get this thing to a thousand horsepower, um, we didn't have enough tape <laughs> because this thing was held together. The runners were all held together to the plenum with tape and, and down to the lower portion of the manifold with tape. Not, none of this was welded together. That, that they were all slip bits would allow us to do this. And in most cases, the, when it was NA, we had no problem. Obviously all that stuff would seal up. And even under boost, even up to 10 or 12 pounds or whatever, we had no problem. The thing just worked. But once we started turning the boost up, as you can see from the design, predictably it just wanted to blow the plenums off. The only thing stopping it from actually launching the plenums off and putting them at various places in the dyno cell was the fact that they were actually still connected to the intercooler and the tubing and that those somewhat held them in place. But what we did, as you can see maybe from the photo, if you look really close, 
There is safety wire, there's extra tape. We did a cross brace out of tape, like maybe that's gonna do something. Um, we just put wire and bailing wire and everything that we could um, to make this setup to work. And so we were just kind of praying at each run that we made when we were turning the boost up that this would work. We did eventually make a thousand horsepower with it and maybe I'll do a video on the buildup and all the dyno testing and stuff, which is kind of cool. But we did make a thousand horsepower, but right after we got the number, it blew the thing off again. And we just got tired of working with it. We knew that we had to weld it all in place so that it would be secure enough. Or maybe use Gorilla Tape instead of that cheap duct tape that we were using because we were doubling up on that and stuff. It was a it was a cool adventure, and but I don't know that I would do it again. I think that now that I know what the plenum or the runner length that I want, we would just then weld it in place and it would be ready to go and we could run boost on it. So now let's check out the three valve. Our final do-it-yourself intake was installed on a 4.6 liter three valve. And I'll show you a couple photos here. We did a lot of testing, um, a lot of adjusting of the runner length because this was an adjustable intake that allowed us to dial it in and, and figure out exactly what power curve we wanted to reproduce. And, but in this case, rather than just doing it as an adjustable piece and calling it good, we used all of that information to produce a finished intake manifold. And I'll go ahead and show you a photo of that. And it's one that we not only did as a finished intake and ran on the engine dyno, but we did it and ran it in the car and drove it around like that for a long time. So here's what happened on our 4.6 liter three valve test motor. Now this thing actually had ported heads on it but it was otherwise stock. Uh, the ported heads turned out that they didn't really change the power curve at all. They didn't add any power. So let me know what you guys think. Did Have you ever run 4.6 liter three valve stuff with ported heads and did they change the power? Maybe we needed cams in this thing to really show what the ported heads could do. Maybe they had additional airflow. You know, they wouldn't be realized unless we had more motor, but they didn't change anything. So this was a stock motor, ported heads, stock intake, stock throttle body which we operated manually. It did have JBA long tube headers and was tuned by a fast XFI management system. Run in that trim, the naturally aspirated one, made 350 horsepower and 349 foot-pounds of torque. And here's what happened after we added our finished intake, not one of the prototypes, not one of the adjustable prototypes. So I purposely chose a longer runner configuration for the finished piece. I was I wanted to enhance the power output down low, which is where mo more guys would enjoy it, I think. I mean, one, the modular motors are really not known for their torque, so I kind of wanted to change that. So you could see we lost out at the top past 5,500, but if you look at 4,100, we picked up 40 foot-pounds of torque going from 332 to 372. So that was a big gain. So now the question was, would we see the same thing under boost? Because we ran a Vortex supercharger, so I'm going to get rid of the... I'm going to just keep the stock intake up there. Here's what happened when we added the Vortex Supercharger to the stock intake. You can see rising curve, rising power curve because of the rising boost curve. You know, it's pretty predictable. This thing was running about 22 degrees of timing with a Vortex. I'll go ahead and put the boost numbers up here. We made no changes to the pulley or anything on the Vortex. All we did was change the intake manifold. Basically, they run at the same air fuel and same timing. But here's what happened when we put the new intake on with the Vortec. And as you can see, it did the same thing that it did NA. So if you look at this green line here, or I'm circling, and the red line, that's the torque curve for the supercharged combination. If we look at the same area, you know, 41 or 2 or 300 RPM, we picked up like 70 foot-pounds of torque when it was supercharged. So the gains were even greater when they were boosted. And here's an, another important point, and I, and I don't really have an answer for this, and maybe you guys can chime in on this and let me know. You'll, you'll remember when I had the comparison with the naturally aspirated intake, the stock intake, and this new intake, the crossover point where we stopped making as much, or this intake stopped making as much power as the stock intake, was about 55 or 5600. But as you'll notice, once it was supercharged, they didn't converge until about 6,000 RPM. Normally, I see these to kind of be the same. It may vary by 100 or 200 RPM, um, depending on what's happening. Let me know what you guys think. We had no control over the variable cam. All we did was leave it unplugged, whatever that default is, because we were running it with a fast. I don't know what that is. I don't have full control over all the variables. So let me know what you guys think, but let's get to our conclusion. Okay, guys, what do you think about our discussion and eventual dyno results on the 4.6 liter two valve and three valve DIY intake manifolds, NA and boost? Now, the reality is, as we've said time and time again, 
An intake manifold that does well, naturally aspirated, is going to do well under boost. Intake manifolds basically are RPM specific, which is why we're adjusting the runner length anyway. We're trying to figure out and decide for the intake manifold where it needs to be for the rest of the combination. If we've got big cams on it, we wanna make power at the top end, we shorten the runner length, and so we make the intake manifold match the cam timing. Hopefully we have enough head flow to go with those other two things so everybody's working together and cooperating. If we wanna make more power down low, we lengthen the runner. And a lot of guys go, well, yeah, but what happens under boost? Well, exactly the same thing happens under boost. If we have an intake manifold that has runner length that's designed to make peak power at 6,500 RPM, when we add boost to it, it's going to make peak power at or near 6,500 RPM. It might be a little bit higher than that, but basically the shape of the curve is gonna kind of stay the same as we saw in the 4.6 liter three valve intake. When we ran it NA, it did one thing. When we ran it under boost, it did the same thing. Everything was just higher, and that's kind of what boosted intake manifolds do. There's no magic intake manifold. They do the same thing <laughs> under boost. Armature Holdner, guys, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. More testing coming up.